residents, but you can imagine if you're paying $2,500 a year on taxes, a 40% decrease in that, particularly with someone with a family, makes a big difference. And so I took that on and I said, I'm going to try to fix that. So what did I do? Like any other legislator in the Utah legislature, you open up a bill file. And there's two or three ways you can do that. You can do it by phone. You can pick up your phone and call someone in the Office of Legislative Research and General Counsel. Or you can send them an email and you say, essentially, I want to open up a bill file on this subject. And that's how it starts. And uh, eventually you receive a word. It's usually it's a process that really works. And, you know, it's a, it's a lay legislature. Uh, everybody brings a certain amount of expertise. Whether you're in business or whether you're in the legal profession, Senator Hatch was in the title business, he was a rancher. He, he had a, a very broad perspective of what. Hi, my name's Don, can I help you? <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad they didn't corrupt you. So, you know, there's a really fine line, I guess, between institutional knowledge and a conflict of interest, and you have to watch that. You, you've got to walk. You hear about that a lot, community organizing, that buzzword. Um, but that's what we do on the right, and it is hard work. It's not super easy for people to come in and make phone calls or related industries that have some of the highest occupational licensing requirements are in the construction industry. And so, um, yeah, we're working on really helping educate legislators. There are going to be several bills this session that address this issue. Um, one that when I was knocking doors, talking to voters in um, the Utah County area um, where um, a member of the committee, like he's a committee chair, and lived. Um, she told me she moved here from Texas and she was a beautician and had been doing hair and had clientele for several years, probably a decade. And she had um, lots of experience. Well, when she moved to Utah, she found out that her license didn't carry here um, and that she would have to go back to school essentially and do, I think it was more than 300 hours of additional training. Um, and including in that was learning how to do nails, you know, learning how to, to, to do, and she's like, I never, I would never, I don't, I don't plan on doing acrylic nails, I never want to do nails, but that was what was required of her to do in order to become a licensed beautician and do hair. Um, and one extreme issue was, you know, they were, I don't know how many of you heard of Justina Clayton in our state, but she was a, a woman who braided hair, did African hair braiding for people. And the legislature was trying to pass a regulation that African hair braiding would be required to get a license to become a, a hair braider. Um, and so it just, it, it, it continues, you know, industries continue to lobby legislators for higher restrictions and higher costs. And if you look at the Institute of Justice did an interesting study to show that occupational licensing laws and, and these things and, and fees and restrictions and requirements don't always, have, they don't equate to better health and safety standards for everyone. And when I'm talking about occupational licensing, obviously I'm lowering the barrier to entry, it's not necessarily for those things like doctors and, and things that will, you know, do require lots of training and, and lots of education. Um, we're talking about things like upholstering, you know, things like this. And like you saw in the video of how an interior decorator or painter is required, you know, having more training than an EMT. So those are the kind of things where we can lower the barrier to entry, and, and we're really hurting the, the most vulnerable and needy in our in our in our state when we when we have these requirements and require these fees, because oftentimes it is those people who you know are looking you know for, or who are who are poor and need and want those kind of jobs occupations, um, and so just some statistics on occupational licensing. Um, and then same thing with education. We're pushing a lot of school choice. Um, we, we, we want, and we're also pushing for local control in education. That is a major passion and issue um, Americans for Prosperity seeks to uh, you know, address in our state. Um, we feel like, you know, right now we've got an issue before us. There's our schools now, is that what it's called, John? Our schools now? Uh, education now. Education now, something like that. Um, they're pushing for a potential income tax increase. Um, it would be about a 20%, I would say, increase for a, like for an income tax. And it's, it equates to 3.8, or they're asking for 7 eighths of 1% increase. 
um, for everybody, um, and in the name of you know more funding for education. Talk about you know how to how to talk to legislators, how to be a citizen lobbyist, um, and I'm happy to get into any other discussions you guys want for however much time we have until Heather needs to move on to other items in your agenda. Um, so again, I'm Representative John Standard, and I have been, I was first elected in 2012. This will be my fifth session in the legislature. Uh, like Heather mentioned, we met in 2010 on Senator Mike Lee's campaign staff, the first, his first election to the United States Senate, uh, along with also Connor Boyack, who's the president of the Veritas Institute, who was there at that time too. Um, and great people, great things that they do. So a couple things I wanted to mention real quick, and then we can get into communicating and those sorts of things. Um, my personal view, I, I try not to paint myself into a box of much of anything category, uh, be it libertarian, or I'm with this group, or I'm with that group, or not, or whatever. Um, I look at each thing, and I do what I feel is right on that particular issue. And I may, you know, end up okay with certain groups, and I may not with other groups. That's okay. I feel like let it be what it is. Uh, Heather was talking about the scorecards that some groups do, and they're going to start doing one that will track certain bills, and then they rank every legislator on how they voted on those different things. Uh, those serve a purpose. Personally, I don't really like them, because I've watched legislators who vote by scorecard, and I think that's wrong. I think they should research the issue and vote on the issue, not vote by the scorecard, because they want to score well with a particular group. I, I vote how I feel like I need to vote, and let the scorecards be what they are. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it gives some reference, and it lets people <coughs> Uh, you know, see what other groups think about those sorts of things. Um, so anyway, the reason Heather asked me to talk about communication, being a citizen lobbyist, how to, how to talk to and work with legislators and how to influence us and those sorts of things. So, um, and I, I love questions, I love discussions, so I'd much rather have you guys ask questions and chime in rather than me just talking the whole time. So please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions as we go. So, the biggest thing I'll say offhand is you, you carry a lot more weight than you think you do. And I, I say, oh, that's one of the secrets, but I tell everybody that, so I don't know how much of a secret it is. But you would be amazed how little interaction we get from our constituents on those bills, like none. Um, if we get two or three people commenting on something, um, that's normal or, or, or high. Uh, the really controversial things, you know, we get 10 or 12 bills a year that are pretty controversial. We get a lot on those. But most things, we get very, very, very little response or, or interaction with constituents. So those who do, their voice carries a lot more weight than they think it does. So do it. You know, you can have a lot more influence than you think that you do. Uh, as Representative Snow and, Ips and Senator Ibsen, when they were speaking earlier, and they were talking about that, how we really pay attention if something comes from our constituents. Um, we do, and we all, um, it's not really spoken, but we all treat it this way. We all really just view Washington County as our constituents, even though it's divided by three and a half house districts. Um, my intern knows, we all pretty much have our interns handle our email during the session, because there's just too much to do every bit of it ourselves personally. Um, my intern's always, always instructed, if an email comes from somebody in Washington County, I need to see it. Uh, and I know we're all that way. So we really, really pay attention and want to know what anybody from the county is, is thinking. We all view the whole county as our constituents. Um, uh, Senator Ibsen mentioned something earlier, too, that I wanted to pick up on. The difference of form-filled emails versus individually written emails. Um, a lot of groups, I mean, Veritas does it and others, they have systems where you can go on and it has a pre-written message, you type in your address, it finds your representatives and it sends it for you and does it. And I understand why they do that, they're trying to simplify it and make it easier for people to do that. Um, when I get 400 form emails of the exact same word-for-word -word thing, it's not that I don't pay attention to those and I don't care about those, they just get filed, the intern in the end will say how many was there, you know, well, four against, whatever. Um, I don't need to look at each one because they're all exactly the same and they do not carry the same weight. When somebody's taken the time to actually write out their own message and I can tell that they did it themselves and they sent it and they live in my county, that's what matters. Um, so, not saying don't do the other, but uh, you'll have probably 10 times the impact if you take the time to write your own message and send it personally rather than use an automated system. So I highly recommend that with just interacting with legislators in general. Um, be polite, be kind. We're people, we're trying to do good. Um, you may or may not agree with everything every legislator does, but 
treat each other with respect. We try to do that for inflammatory, accusatory, whatever, uh, you know, especially in public. Um, be nice, be civil. You know, it, it goes a lot further sometimes than, than trying to do the opposite. Um, So most of the time, they're going to say you have two minutes. I mean, sometimes one minute, sometimes three minutes. But I mean, it's pretty short. So know that going in and know what you want to say. And it's, it's not that it's not OK to have some passion and to let some emotion. But it's hard because you're not, you know, most people aren't used to getting up in front of. And it's intimidating. The committee's in a circle kind of around you. And you're at the table down below. And most people aren't used to that environment. And they can get emotional, and it's hard to do that, and they feel pressure. Um, but try to control it. Try not to get, you know, come across as angry or, um, you know, just you want to sound rational, thoughtful, um, have arguments that that are factual arguments that address it that make sense. Now, have some personal stories, and and it's okay to go on the emotions of people, but not to a point that you feel like you're kind of emotionally out of control. That makes sense. I mean, there's there's a balance of it's okay to have some stories and emotions. You also want to have some facts and figures that make sense, but you don't want to come across as angry, crazy, you know, that it's broken, and that the federal government imposes itself on our daily lives and on our state, fighting these federal issues, and realizing that it's just one person also dropped in this ocean of influence and. You know, this wall of bureaucracy in Washington that almost seems impenetrable. And as he thought about how he could impact the lives of his family, his friends, his neighbors, his fellow Utahns, when it came to federal policy, he realized he had very little influence or impact. And that perhaps really couldn't do anything about it. But then he realized that oftentimes the tyrant down the street is worse than the tyrant stays away. And realized that he could have an influence and an impact on our community through state policy. And so we started the Libertas Institute for that purpose, to make a difference here in Utah in state policy. Because there are many ways in which our state laws can impact your life, impact your freedom, your property rights, your liberty. And so the Libertas Institute is a 501c3 policy institute, similar to like the Heritage Foundation or the Cato Institute, which are national think tanks headquartered in DC that work on a variety of policy, much of it federal, we focus only on Utah policy, on state policy. And there are think tanks like Libertas across the country and other states. Um, I think of a, a group called the Independent Institute in Colorado, the Goldwater Institute in Arizona, um, the Texas Public Policy Foundation in Texas. A lot of groups working for limited government and liberty and, uh, and trying to advance a conservative agenda in their state through state policy. And so that's what Libertas Institute does. We exist to educate and inform the public about issues. Um, we are permitted under tax law to do a limited amount of lobbying. And since our state legislature is so short and brief, um, and because it's so accessible, we don't have to spend a lot of resources to engage with legislators. And so we also do issue advocacy on, on the Hill.